Hello. All right, and so I hope you guys, I hope I had given enough on the, um, on the war for independence to help you out. Uh, but also you guys are showing clear signs of um, comprehending the material without any extraneous help. Uh, you're doing very well in the argumentative assignments. Um, thank you for your patience as I'm finishing up my semester uh, at my other place of employment at my other school. And so uh, they've been requiring a lot of my time. Um, but uh, we're getting into now the, um, the confederation, right? So we tried a confederacy uh, before we, um, we devised the republic, the federal republic that we have today. And so with that, uh, it, it has a very... Um, long-standing narrative that you see a number one uh, that you know oftentimes one interpretation has not withstood uh, the scrutiny of subsequent generations uh, of historians who've gone after that interpretation and you know in some cases uh, torn it up but this one just seems to prevail uh, generation after generation and so um, those of you who do uh, go on as history majors uh, you'll certainly run across it again as the most popular interpretation uh, to the, the failure of our um, Confederacy. And um, yeah, so uh, why is that? Well, uh, let's see here. I don't know how much I want to get into it before I show it. Uh, but remember that during the War for Independence, uh, virtually all the states, all the uh, colonies, the 13 colonies, uh, devised new state constitutions. And in many ways, uh, there were exceptions, uh, but in many cases, the majority of cases, uh, they became more enlightened. Uh, they uh, broadened the franchise, uh, those who were uh, you know, uh, included as citizens and who could vote and run for office, et cetera. Uh, almost without exception, uh, they broadened the franchise. Uh, they uh, claimed the social contract in their preambles. Uh, a guy named Mason, George Mason, uh, you know, he, he wrote about the social contract and inalienable rights uh, before Jefferson did, to the point of some people thinking that Jefferson kind of copied off of him. Um, let's see here. Uh, they, uh, about at least five states, um, declared their um, uh, an abolition of slavery. Now, a lot of them, however, uh, those abolition uh, uh, emancipation proclamations, a lot of them declared a gradual compensated emancipation, uh, contending that the slaves had to be bought at market price, that the slaves uh, up to a certain year, uh, they demarcated a certain year, uh, those above them and below them, uh, it was different for each, who could be freed and who had to remain as slaves uh, for that final generation. But nevertheless, you know, uh, better than nothing. And so uh, they put it into uh, slavery in at least five states in the North. And th they're gonna start a, you know, a, a political trend, if you will, so that by the time of the Civil War, only Delaware in the North uh, will have uh, slaves and slavery and uh, the rest of the northern states will have uh, abolished it. And so um, you have that. You have the fact that, uh, you know, with the Enlightenment rhetoric, they were against um, too much power in the executive branch, because the executive branch, right, those who execute the law, who have police powers, et cetera, they thought were the most prone to become tyrannical, uh, you know, tyrants over the people. So, uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania did away with a governor and many of the other states deliberately created uh, a governor position that was constitutionally weak uh, compared to their popularly elected uh, legislator, right? And uh, a lot of them had short terms of office. So hence there was a lot of rollover, a lot of accountability uh, because, you know, once you're in, you're gonna, be ha you're gonna have to run for reelection just within two years anyway. And so, um, so you, could, you could make the argument that during the War for Independence, we were in collectively 
an enlightened uh, phase of our national development. So along with that was the Scottish libertarian movement, the, the Whigs, right? Uh, the oppositional Whigs back in England and Scotland, et cetera. And uh, they were the liberal party and they were the liberals within that liberal party. No, uh, the other Whigs called them radicals. And uh, they, they feared any type of um, excessive government. They feared any type of large government. And so they wanted things to stay decentralized. And so they had been familiar, uh, those who had had a classical education uh, with the confederations of Greece uh, back in the day in the ancient time period, uh, the classical time period that is, uh, uh, the medieval time period in some of the Scandinavian countries, uh, they had tried a confederation. And so uh, they thought that was a good idea. And with a confederation, they thought of it as a lesser evil. Uh, that you know, government ought to be localized. It ought to be small and weak, and accountable, right? And so they deliberately made the Articles of Confederation a weak and democratic and loosely put together uh, government, and that they thought that was the uh, the best safeguard against tyranny of a strong central executive, etc. Right? And so, um, what happens? Well, the popular interpretation is that you find in number one is that the people would not adhere to civic virtue. Uh, that also was part of the rhetoric of the, the revolution, if you will. Uh, civic virtue, I think of like Tacitus and Cicero back in Rome, where when you make a decision politically, it ought to be what's best for the entire republic, not simply what's best for you, right? So as an opposite and uh, an antithesis to uh, civic virtue is, I would say, is factionalism. And a faction is a group that shares the same self-interest uh, and or the same ideology uh, with one another. And they look out for their own agenda and they don't really care uh, beyond the scope of their own goals and um yeah, and dreams, etc. And so uh, factionalism was seen by people, conservatives like George Washington, as a as a very negative word, right? That if, if different factions, so let's say uh, uh, tobacco farmers, no matter where they are, are all a single faction. Uh, industrial textile uh, entrepreneurs, uh, artisans, some type of skilled worker and some type of trade, no matter where they are, share the same self-interest economically, et cetera. So at any rate, with the idea of factionalism is the conservatives said it will undo a country uh, if, if different factions only look out for their own and not what's best for the entire you know, country, uh, look out. And so what they could look at is um, they could look at um, Rome and Greece, et cetera, in their classical education, and demonstrate and see how they have, um, how factionalism tore them apart. And so for instance, with Rome, I think of the, uh, the Gracchus brothers uh, getting the plebeians of the tribunes, the lower house of the Rome's Republic uh, to rise up against the Senate and against the consuls. And it, it literally caused a civil war in Rome, uh, like, like class warfare. And so um, the conservatives watched as Americans behaved in this generation with this very democratic or relatively democratic, right? Relative to what they had before, relative to what was found in many other parts of the world, et cetera. Uh, this relatively democratic and relatively decentralized uh, government and they, they were able to tell the libertarian liberals, see, I told you so. I told you that people cannot handle too much democracy. People cannot handle too decentralized of a government. Uh, and this kind of in, informed the founding fathers uh, when they would later go to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, you could see a sense of cynicism and conservatism uh, in that document 
whereby there's a distrust of human nature. Uh, there's a distrust of anyone with power, but there's also a distrust of the masses of people. And so, for instance, you know, you had different states uh, that um, began to uh, grant stay laws on loans because there were a lot of poor white citizens uh, who were trying to uh, make it right with the American dream uh, by way of um, business, uh, commercial crop farming, right? But it takes money to make money. And so they needed loans to start their businesses, to start their farms. And many of them uh, were not able to pay back their loans. So they would apply pressure to their democratically elected legislator uh, to give them stay laws, to grant them two to five more years of, of mercy, basically, uh, to pay back their loans. And then eventually, in some of the states, they, they passed the uh, bankruptcy laws to just let themselves off the hook. And so those who were lending obviously became wary and did not want to lend to the poor white farmers uh, anymore. And so you had economic repercussions to this democratic and selfish tendency uh, to, to, uh, to rise and to get loans and not have to pay them back. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, New Jersey and New York had commercial wars against one another. So uh, whereby when uh, some rivers connect the two adjacent states and um, whereby uh, you know people would come from the other state into theirs, they would heavily tax them. So then the other state responded by heavily taxing the contrary, those from the other state coming into them. And it, it caused you know economic distress. Uh, to both economies of New Jersey and New York. Uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia uh, fought over the Ohio Valley, each contending by its original charters that the Ohio Valley was theirs. And there didn't seem to be a central power uh, to properly adjudicate or referee uh, the dispute. You had um, far, uh, uh, businessmen who wanted the, the, the closure of the Mississippi uh, especially businessmen from the New England states, uh, because they were jealous, envious, uh, uh, fearful of the economic power of the, uh, the you know, um, infrastructure artery uh, of the Mississippi River and how it could feed the South with all kinds of good supplies and so forth. So they're in their type of petty jealousy uh, with certain Southern businessmen and factions. Uh, they helped vote for and push for uh, approval of Spain's closure of the Mississippi, because at this time, Spain had the Louisiana Territory. It would go back and forth with Spain and France several times. And so they did it just spitefully against other factions. So you see things like that happening, right? And so it's going to create um, economic distress, uh, uh, especially debt uh, issues. Right. And um, it's going to create a political uh, chaos almost. Right. With this loose confederation. And so at any rate, when uh, Shays rebellion happened to a lot of conservatives, especially that was the last straw. Um, so in Shays rebellion, it was like I had mentioned. Similarly, uh, they uh, had been given uh, stay laws uh, and uh, against having to pay back their loans uh, more than once, I believe. And they finally, uh, the Massachusetts legislator finally stood its ground and said, enough is enough. You either pay your loans back um, or we uh, confiscate your collateral, which included their property. So when the judges came to put them on trial and to make them pay their loans or else declare their properties taken over by the state of Massachusetts, uh, the men threatened to kill the judges and formed an even a ragtag army, uh, daring the Massachusetts legislator uh, to, uh, to come and do something about it with its state militia. And a lot of them were wearing their old uniforms, their militia uniforms that they had used to fight Britain in the War for Independence just a few years back. And so likening themselves to continuing the, the spirit of 76, uh, they can they contended, and so they uh, they could not get sufficient um, 
for, for quite some time, uh, sufficient uh, military help from the other 12 states. And uh, it was very precarious. It was very scary. And um, so to the conservatives, that enough was enough. And they're going to contend, you know what? We need a less democratic, uh, with more checks and balances, and a more centralized, right, uh, government than this. And that's what we're going to get in 1787, uh, the summer of that year, with the Constitution. And so the argument is, is that even the libertarians, Patrick Henry, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, even they became quiet uh, when it came to ratification of this new constitution, uh, relatively quiet, because the argument goes deep down, they knew that the conservatives were right, that we had tried a democratic decentralized government and the people ruined it, right? And so it's kind of likened to, you know, uh, a young uh, adolescent adult, you know, 18, 19 years old, and mom and dad said, all right, you're, you're ready to fly, uh, have your independence, you know, but we'll help you with this and with that. And then that, that young man or young woman uh, does everything possibly uh, self-destructive until the mom and dad come back and say, fine, if we had to treat you like a kid again, then so be it. We're no longer helping you with the car payments, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where that's what you get here in this narrative is we tried um, a lot of democracy, a very decentralized government, and the people acted too selfishly, too rashly, and they they ruined it for future generations. And it played right into the conservatives hands, right, who could tell the liberal libertarians, see, I told you so. I told you this wouldn't work. I told you, you need a stronger central government. And I told you that you can't just kowtow to the masses of citizens. All right. So be familiar with that on the test, even if you don't choose number one. And then number two, uh, popular clamor for enlightened and classically liberal government extracted concessions from the founding fathers. And again, my titles give everything away. So in this, okay, you're going to find evidence to suggest, to paint a, a portrait of the founding fathers as somewhat uber conservative. All right. However, you're going to see as they try to get the ratification process established, finished, materialized, the masses of people, the libertarian politicians, journalists, are going to make a lot of noise, ruffle a lot of feathers, make a lot of waves, and insist that there be some enlightened concessions that the founding fathers grant their people, their constituents. So on the one hand, it's somewhat revisionist history with Pauline Meyer's book called Ratification, because you don't get a very you know, democratic, uh, you know, uh, egalitarian, uh, image of the founding fathers. They're kind of elitist snobs who want a strong central government, who want elected reps to be filters of the people, not voices of the people, right? Who are indifferent to a bill of rights and a few other enlightened components that eventually found their way into the Constitution. And then on the other hand, you find a romantic component to her thesis, and that the people of that generation, they were insistent, they demanded 
certain enlightened concessions. So in the case of uh, the New England states, founding fathers write the constitution. The members go back to their states, try to quietly in closed doors, ratify it. And people who were not invited, not officially elected, but yet chosen by their New England towns, showed up to the door and invited themselves in and said, you know, I represent the town of Salem. And the people of Salem contend, we are not okay with this new government and this new constitution unless something be granted to protect citizens' rights to petition the government and to speak their mind in the newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. And then I think you know where that's going is collectively one town after another and one state after another made these demands about individual rights and they collectively amalgamated those demands into a list known as the Bill of Rights. So we could think, according to Pauline Meyer, not the founding fathers, but the people of that generation who demanded such of the founding fathers. And then you ask, well, why would the founding fathers concede it if they weren't necessarily for it? For one, I think you, had, you, you could easily take this thesis a little too far. Even the uber conservative founding fathers, like John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, in some ways pretty conservative was George Washington. They were not monarchists. They were for a republic of checks and balances, right? The, the political spectrum was not that broad between left and right. I don't think. And so when they heard of the idea of, you know, if a bill of rights, the only opposition I've ever heard or problems with it is that I've heard some of the founding fathers contend, well, if we make a list, that list better be good because then it'll be insinuated that if it's not on that list, then the citizens won't have it. That we thought just it was went without saying that people would have those rights. Now that might be a lousy excuse. But my point is, is no one stood up as a conservative and said, I don't want individual rights for citizens. But I don't think it was that ideologically, you know, opposed to their belief systems. It just wasn't a high priority for them. And secondly, I think there is evidence to suggest that they were afraid of rebellion. Shays' Rebellion, uh, the, the drama they had during the War for Independence with the Tories and the Libertarians in Tennessee who didn't want to choose either side but wanted to be left alone. They knew they'd have their hands full if they didn't grant the people some of these things. All right, so are there any questions to either one or two? All right, let me take a look real quickly here. Oops. So take a look, a little early look at test two. What was not mentioned is commonly cited context to the War for Independence. That's in your intro to the War for Independence handout. Population boom and dispersion, absolutely. Political ambiguity regarding the, the status of English colonial men, that's mentioned as well. British plans to placate colonial tensions and granting Native Americans lands 
Hence the proclamation of 1763, absolutely. Historical events that put stress on the British Empire, like gaining territory and losing money amidst the seven Okay, I'm glad I'm looking at this. All, all four of those are right. So I'll need to change that before you take test two. Historians who interpret the American war for independence from Great Britain as a fight to maintain political powers and economic rights that the colonists had already accumulated. Remember that's a salutary neglect thesis. Bernard Balin's thesis is the romantic thesis their connection to intellectual philosophical movements and sources. Uh, B, number four, the Enlightenment's notions of natural rights and social contract regarding the source of a government's legitimacy, its proper role may have ideologically influenced America's propaganda campaign during the war for independence, absolutely. Five, the Great Awakening's lack of deference and obedience toward authoritative figures who had swayed from God's purpose, absolutely. Six, Scottish and English libertarian old school liberals or Whigs emphasize the need to keep those in power accountable regarding abuse of such power and respect for and constitutional protection of the rights of their citizens. Absolutely. A lot of true ones here. Joseph Ellis's book on Washington. I hope you read that one. It shows his ambition being thwarted in a system that he perceived to be unfair and foolish. B. Howard Zinn's thesis was super uh, uh, revisionist, that the founding fathers hijacked a popular rebellion and turned the wrath of the masses toward a British scapegoat. A. Alan Brinkley in the textbook, which of course I would give you because we're not using it for the summer, cynically adheres to Howard Zinn's thesis? No, that's false. Alan Brinkley in the textbook, had we used it, adheres to the salutary neglect thesis. So then 10 and 11, the argumentative section of, uh, on the Articles of Confederation suggested that events occurred that played into the hands of conservatives, whose notion that the commoner's decision would be rash, selfish, and destructive, and whose belief that decentralized government leads to vulnerability and chaos seem to be validated in the eyes of many Americans. Yes. I have too many truths on this test. Pauline Meyer's thesis on ratification of the Constitution contends that the Founding Fathers almost needed public pressure from common Americans to make our present government and Constitution as enlightened and democratic as it is. Yes. Yes, again. And number 12, during and just after the War for Independence, state-level governments established conservative institutions and practices. No, remember? As I blabbed on about at the beginning, this was about as enlightened and revolutionary and liberal as they had, had been. So 12 is false. All right, so sure if I'll be able to, let's see here. So the next one we're going to do is the Constitution, all right? And we'll do this next class, but I want you to note how it's different. You're not reading an argumentative section or multiple sections. You're simply looking at the Constitution and I just copied and pasted it from here. There's the preamble. Article one is on Congress. Article two, soon to come, is on the executive. And article three is on the judiciary. All right. So what I'd like you to do is to go through that list, those of you who want to get a little bit ahead of schedule, and you're simply putting it, you're putting, and, and by all means, I'm not asking you to put 
um, every article of all three sections uh, in, in, on a list. That's too much to ask uh, time-wise. All I ask is that you put four, at least four examples under each of these three categories from the Constitution. Enlightened, four under conservative, and four under pragmatic. And if anybody has a question, I'd be happy to, to further delineate that. But otherwise, um, we're, we're fine schedule-wise. I, I plan on doing so on Thursday. But if you notice, it's a different type of assignment. Uh, professor? Yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if you were showing us the assignment. Um, it's not showing us, or at least it's not showing me on my screen. It's not sharing on my screen. Oh, really? Yeah, so I was a little confused at what you were talking about. So think, are, you, are you talking about the one that I've been doing all along on the- No, just assignment? this one, the constitution assignment. Oh, okay. So it, it so like right now, it's not- Yeah, showing... just, just now, it's just showing like your file, that's it. <laughs> Shoot, I'm sorry. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have to, um, it, it, it seems as if I have to um, have it, have previously opened it before the meeting. I'm sorry. But yeah, um, I'll have plenty of time on Thursday to go over it. But, uh, but yeah, all it is, is just, it's, it's a copy of the constitution. And then it gives my definition uh, subjectively as to what I mean by enlightened, what I mean by conservative, and what I mean by pragmatic. And I asked you to put just four, four articles, uh, four little examples uh, under each of those three categories. Okay, thank you so much. All right, sorry about that. All good, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so anyone else before we, um, we call it a day? Any other questions? If we can't make it to the class, um, will the recording be put up the same day it was recorded or when? Um, uh, I, I, can, I can do my best. I'll do my best, okay? I'm sorry. Because um, to be honest, I'm so technologically challenged that I have to rely upon help, extraneous help uh, to, to, to post each of these. And I'm very sorry for that but that's just the cold hard truth. Uh, but okay. I, will, I will try to get help immediately to, to make that happen. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, anyone else before we call it a day? All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I have your names down. You'll get your extra credit. And so good luck with that. And then come Thursday, we will, uh, we will work on the constitution assignment. And I might even do the early Republic one as well, since next week, as you remember, it oscillates between two a week, then three a week. Uh, next week, there's three, there are three. So I'll probably, uh, I'll probably do two um, on Thursday. All right, so thank you guys, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming, I appreciate it. Thank you.